I mean, if we have to constantly look at ourselves through the lens of what is shareable and framed by the tools that are dominant at the time, you know, will this make a good video or like what is shareable through this, you know, framework is a potentially very damaging way to have to look at yourself and to know yourself. I'm Bethany McLean. Did you ever have a moment of doubt about capitalism? and whether greed's a good idea. And I'm Luigi Zingales. We have socialism for the very rich, rugged individualism for the poor. And this is Capital Isn't, a podcast about what is working in capitalism. First of all, tell me, is there some society you know that doesn't run on greed? And most importantly, what isn't? We ought to do better by the people that get left behind. I don't think we should have killed the capital system in the process. Luigi, what did you have for breakfast this morning? Just a cup of coffee. Haven't you? Didn't your mother teach you that breakfast is the most important meal of the day and that you must eat some protein in the morning? No. Remember, I grew up in Italy where the only protein we have for breakfast is the occasional milk we put in the cappuccino. Aha. So I'm, I'm just teasing you. I actually hate breakfast. Rather, I like breakfast food, but I like breakfast at, at like the middle of the day. And oddly enough, the myth that breakfast is the most important meal of the day, and it is a myth, it's just propaganda. It's just an invention of a guy named Edward Bernays, who's the nephew of Freud and the inventor of propaganda. And it was an invention aimed at selling more bacon. In today's episode of Capitalism, we want to discuss the role of influencers, and we want to do it in the broader context of the propaganda industry. The propaganda industry. Do you mean the publicity industry? Since you got me started with Edward Bernays, I want to stick to him. As you know, in 1928, he wrote a book called Propaganda. What he meant was mostly advertising, but the term became radioactive because the Nazis use it. So he relabeled it public relations in the political context and promotion in the commercial one. But I prefer to use the original term because it makes it clear what it is. Mm -hmm. It's really, language is so interesting, isn't it? And I think we should discuss private propaganda to differentiate it from the government one, because propaganda has become an essential, whether you call it propaganda or whether you call it publicity or whether you call it promotion, it's become an essential component of the capitalist system is a relatively recent phenomenon. First of all, you have to have the media to have promotion. But most importantly, private advertising really started after the so-called Second Industrial Revolution at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th, when companies discover economies of scale. So one example I always say to my students is that, you know, when James Duke, later named the Duke University, introduced the first automatic cigarette-making machine, his production increased 40 times. So when all of a sudden you have such an enormous increase in, in production, you need to sell your stuff. And how do you sell a lot of stuff? You need to promote it. That's the reason why Duke started mass advertising. So Duke and co. used the social media of the time, right, which were literary magazines like Collier's, McClure's, and Cosmopolitan. You know, it's sort of an interesting contradiction is that these magazines had become popular by exposing the economic and social problems of the time, not arguably not contributing to them. The Jungle, the famous expose on the Chicago meatpacking industry, first came out as a series in, in, one of these, in one of these magazines. So I guess not surprisingly, the advertising money uh, severely tempered the muckraking tendency tendency of these of these magazines. And it's a story in some ways that seems to repeat again today, where bloggers and Instagram posters get their fame by by telling their stories, and then they cash in by using their reputation to advertise. And if they're was truth that they were speaking originally, that truth starts to become tempered, shall we say, by 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 the money. Do you think that's fair? Absolutely. And to explore this phenomenon, today we're going to talk to Emily Hunt, a researcher of the Center for Digital Culture and Society at UPenn, but most importantly, the author of the recent book, The Influencer Industry. So before we introduce Emily, let's define for our listeners what we mean by influence and influencers. Influence is, quote, the capacity to have an effect on the behavior of somebody, while influencers are people who have built a reputation for their knowledge and expertise on a certain topic and use it to make money. And with this knowledge in mind, let's welcome Emily to the show. 
So, Emily, in your book, you do a very nice job of inserting the influence industry in the historical context. Can you tell us what is new? Some things that are new about the influencer space. One is the way that the influencer industry has helped rewrite the way we think about work, what it means to be a creative producer. It has also rewritten uh, the way we think about ourselves and our relationship to marketplaces, really broken down barriers between the individual and commercial activity. You know, the influencer space really requires people who are working within it to sell themselves in a very direct way and to partner with brands in a much more intimate way. Does intimate mean more authentic? I mean, why do consumers trust this trust influencers so much? It can be more authentic, but there can also be a sort of sleight of hand going on in which the authenticity is a front for the brand and just a different a different way of selling. So why does it engender more intimacy when there can be a sleight of hand to it? It's partially how they were introduced to us. So if we think back to you know the 2000s, early 2010s, when the influencer industry really first started gaining traction, you know social media was new. We didn't really have the sort of cynicism and suspicion about social media that that is more widespread now. As early influencers were introduced to us, it was under this sort of understanding that these were really just regular seeming people who really were, you know, more relatable to the to the average person than like, you know, a celebrity was or a person, you know, who's working at a major media company or or things like that. Um, and I think that really set the tone for the industry. And even as it has grown enormously, this idea that influencers are people who are, you know, just following their passion and just genuinely creating content because they love to do it remained like incredibly pervasive mm-hmm. and marketers and brands recognized early on that 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 idea was what made this space monetizable mm-hmm. they realized we need to maintain this aura of authenticity even as the space becomes hyper commercialized even as the creators have to become more and more strategic in their content creation and the way that they communicate with their audience we have to maintain this sense of authenticity because that's what this is all about and at the same time you know if we look to these other sources of information that we have if we look to the major media companies people have been losing faith in these institutions for a long time. You know, there hasn't really been as much competition as, you know, there might be in an alternate world where maybe you can imagine that people have a lot of trust in journalism, for example. You come out of a traditional media background. How do you think traditional media left itself open to the rise of influencers and its own loss of influence? Traditional media never adjusted to the fact that the internet existed <laughs> and at all in, in wanting to preserve Deserve, you know, the power that they had that had been entrenched for so long. They, they spent too much energy trying to hold on to that or trying to absorb influencers into this old format. It's heartbreaking in a way. You know, I come out of magazines. I trained as a journalist. <laughs> I was seeing how the places that I worked we're trying to figure out, you know, okay, what are we going to do with these bloggers? <laughs> what are we going to do with social media? Look, this person has like tons of followers. Like, what if we, what if we had her write something or, or, you know, what if we hired this person to like shoot something for us? Or on one hand, I thought, yeah, like, this is great. This is exciting that you're, you know, you're working with people who aren't coming up through the traditional pipeline. But on the other hand, this is concerning because if you're hiring someone to write who doesn't have have any training in journalism, what is that going to mean for what we're publishing, especially again at scale? Like you hire one person to write one column, not a big deal. But if all of these media institutions are hiring people <laughs> who don't have journalistic backgrounds to, to write for them, then what does that mean for our media and information landscape? One of my really persistent concerns, and it's kind of interesting that I have sort of arrived at this place that of thinking that the influencer space needs needs sort of a more professionalization like journalism had. I don't want, I am not arguing for the value of this sort of 
uh, the gatekeeping and the hurdles that, you know, kept people who didn't go through great schools or didn't have family money or didn't have any of this sort of pre-existing capital to get through. I don't want that, but I do want a shared understanding of the role of the influencer in society and some governing ethics like the journalism industry has or, or once had. One of the things I like of your book is that you talk about personal branding or personal brands. One passage I read from your book say individuals on social media work to simplify and distill their personalities into easily understandable personal brands. And I feel that this is happening also in the academia with some potentially very dangerous effects. Let's pick on epidemiologists, but I could pick on economists as well. And says, if I become an influencer and I push very hard pro-vaccine, et cetera, et cetera, do I want to do a study where I can identify some side effects of vaccine? Because even if I'm fully vaccinated and I believe in vaccines, some vaccines do have side effects and it's important to study the side effects of vaccines. But if I constructed my public persona into this uh, unqualified supporter of vaccines, I find it difficult to do research and promote research in a different direction. So my fear is that the influencer industry or the, the, the world of social media is actually changing the world of academia and changing for worse. This is part of how the, the industry is changing all of our relationships to our work, I think. And it's not just in academia, but I think the earliest signs of how the influencer space is sort of requiring that more and more people, you know, brand themselves. And, you know, I write in the book a bit about, you know, Walmart's program where they're encouraging their employees to, you know, act as influencers as well. And so it is really this this incitement to brand yourself is becoming more pervasive in society than I think I even knew was possible when I when I first started this research project. And that comes with tremendous consequences. You know, if the people who are sort of pushed ahead in in their professions, whether it is in academia or it is in your, you know, professional track at Walmart. The people who are being sort of brought to the front and rewarded are people who are able to do the influencer thing well, able to brand themselves and sort of distill their personalities and their work online for an audience. Um, you know, you're leaving a lot of people behind who who are probably very good at the job of researcher or the job of, you know, merchandiser or what have you. And you're just incentivizing all the wrong things. I, I think there's huge potential to damage like just a wide range of professions. Yeah, and potentially a wide range of people too. I was thinking about this as the ultimate triumph in some ways of personality over character, you know, having to have a personality and a persona versus anything that's more internal, subterranean, um, private, and that it shapes humanity in a way too. Yeah, I mean, if we have to constantly look at ourselves through the lens of what is shareable and framed by the tools that are dominant at the time, you know, will this make a good video or like what is shareable through this, you know, framework is a potentially very damaging way to have to look at yourself and to know yourself. Let me push back a bit because uh, you you come from a different discipline than I do. So uh, you see everything in terms of power. I see in, everything in terms of maybe information. Let me try this alternative narrative. Information is diffuse. And in the past, for example, marketing departments were spending a lot of money trying to collect this information, do focus groups, but it was very much top down. Now we have found a way to do it more bottom up. It's true that some of these people are paid to promote this stuff, but it's also true is they literally put their face in front of it. And also that some stuff doesn't work. And you mentioned in your book, the very interesting Michael Bloomberg uh, campaign where they pay influencer it was a complete flop. There wasn't a, a grassroots demand. Maybe in the media of the 60s or 70s, somebody like Mike Bloomberg would have won the election because uh, he could, from the top, push that. But even with all the money he had, and he had plenty, he couldn't change the result of uh, the, the primary. So maybe it is a way to aggregate information bottom-up. And the reason why 
I might buy a product or you might buy a product is because you see somebody like you using the product and putting their face behind that. And uh, that's a very useful information. Yeah, it's not like the influencer industry it has been all bad, you know, like, <laughs> uh, there are some ways that it has democratized culture, you could say. Um, and it has sort of forced people at the top to listen to what consumers, you know, really want. We live in a world of information overload and people are busy. And if you find an influencer who, you know, resonates with you for some reason and you, you, you know, identify with them and you see they buy, you know, XYZ products, it makes your life easier to say, okay, I need to buy new dishes or I need new sheets or whatever. And I'm just going to get what this person had. That is absolutely part of influencers value is that they make buying decisions easier for their followers. And also like to, to your other point, like they need to listen to, to the consumer. I think, so I started this research way back when I was coming from the fashion media industry. And I think if you look at fashion as an example, you can see just how much fashion influencers have forced the sort of old guard, very much top down, like elite driven industry to change in representation, like in fashion advertising and brands, you know, expanding their offerings to cater to more, you know, body types and interests and things like that. It absolutely has shifted things and facilitated a sort of bottom up approach to a lot of industries. But that being said, the reality is not like this wonderful, culturally democratic space that I think a lot of that I think was promised and continues to be promised by some people some people in power in this industry, it, that the reality is not that. You know, when we think about the spread of misinformation, when we think about like the spread of these sort of toxic body image ideals, the mental health toll on people who identify as creators and their really significant rates of depression and burnout, then we are kind of benchmarking against recent history and thinking maybe this isn't so great. My research of the space over the last 10 years has indicated that the people who have been working in the industry often don't have the time, honestly, or the resources, I suppose, to take that time to sit back and think about the, like, the long-term impacts of what they were doing. We are at a point where we have seen where that approach to this work has gotten us. And yeah, there's been some really wonderful things that have happened. There's also been some really awful things that have happened. And it's important to think about what kind of future do we want? We can't just like keep kind of scrambling around and just like keeping our heads above water today. We need a vision that uh, we're working toward. Somewhat paradoxically, I suppose, but I think part of the solution is more like professionalization of the influencer space. So not saying that we need to now gatekeep like these older that like these older industries did, you know, when it was really difficult to break into, you know, but we do need the influencer industry to sort of recognize its own power and to sort of coalesce a little bit as an industry um, around some ideas about what is our role, you know, uh, and how and what are, you know, our sort of ethical guidelines and what does it mean to work in this space? Because there isn't a lot of shared understanding of that. You know, some influencers are very transparent with their branding deals and some brands pay really fairly and like everything is above board and very like professional and sort of benefiting everyone involved. And then there is a lot of other kind of junk and unfairness that happens. And so I think if we can get to a place where there's like a better shared understanding of what it means to be an influencer, and then some better public understanding of what influencers do, I think that would go a long way toward evolving the industry toward a more sort of positive place. So part of that vision is influenced by technology, of course. The job of influencer appears to be very independent, but it's actually hugely dependent on the platform algorithms. So how do you, how do you think about that role of technology and what influence the influencer industry needs to have over, over the platform algorithms in order to be truly independent? That's a good question. I mean, the, the industry has always been very much shaped like by the 
the tools that are available to them. And that in turn has also shaped the sort of construction of authenticity that we were talking about before. And as technology has evolved and it has, and new tools have come about to make monetizing the content easier, that has really enabled the industry to grow quite a bit. So when we think about like the introduction of like affiliate links, which is, you know, when influencers post a product and then, you know, they're able to earn a commission um, when people click through or, or buy the product. Um, the introduction of m- ever more, you know, sophisticated tools that enable both influencers and brands to measure, you know, the performance of their content. Um, and also, you know, of course, as you mentioned, like uh, the way that the platforms tweak their algorithms over time um, privileges particular types of content. And that is very much why we now find ourselves in this era of video. <laughs> it's because the popularity of TikTok and then Instagram and Meta want to compete with TikTok. And so they are prioritizing reels. Everyone has to make videos in order to be seen. So influencers, they are at the mercy of the tools that are available, but they also help push the the evolution of, of new tools. So it, it is sort of this like, you know, push pull give and take relationship when you look at it over time. You know, I don't think that Instagram, you know, would be in the place that it is now providing all of these sort of uh, measurement tools and, and, you know, tools to really enable influencer marketing. They are doing that in response to what influencers have done and the, and the way that the users have behaved on the space. But at the same time, ultimately, the platforms are in control of the algorithms and therefore they are in control of what type of content is being surfaced. My many interviews over the years have indicated that influencers feel very much, you know, at the mercy of platforms and they are in this sort of like precarious position of never knowing what the future holds. And, and you know, the platform companies owe influencers a lot, but they don't have a relationship where they are really like accountable to influencers. You know, they, you know, they're, there's no like requirement of uh, transparency. And so influencers are sort of in this space where they're like, I don't know if I'm going to have to completely, you know, learn a new skill, like, like they had to learn video and video editing and stuff like that. You know, I don't know if I'm gonna have to learn a new skill. I don't know if my content is going to start tanking because they're going to take away, you know, they're going to make some change that makes me much less visible. So building on this, I think that it appears as this democratization information coming from the bottom, but in reality, the filters the platforms create are incredibly important. Let me make an example in the other area. In the era of wine, I don't know if you know who Robert Parkett uh, is or was, was a very famous uh, uh, wine taster. And he became so influential that many vineyards started to produce wine to fit the taste of Robert Parker because Robert Parker would promote their wine and that was very valuable. And but this is a small niche, uh, one guy who was influential, but not. In the case of platform, they have an enormous power. It's, it's the power of Robert Parker multiplied by a billion, probably. And they have an enormous responsibility. So, for example, if I want to be an influencer, by definition, I want my stuff to circulate. So I'm trying to second guess what makes my stuff retweeted, reshared, et cetera, et cetera. The algorithm that Facebook or Meta has created is that if you appeal to the worst instinct of human beings, that stuff goes viral. And so the, all the, fa- the explosion of violence and hate speech that we see is not just an issue of people posting. It is that it's rewarded by the algorithm. And so my fear is that what this, uh, this might appear as this the perfect democratic institution is in reality a very subtle way to manufacture consent, and I use on purpose the Chomsky title, manufacture consent in a very specific direction. That is the problem, is that the platforms get to decide what gets rewarded. And a lot of times that it is the the things that end up harming the individual. And whether it is, you know, the more extreme cases of hate speech and violence and things like that, or even in this... Uh, necessity to share personal information, you know, in the influencer space. Influencers are very much incentivized to share pictures of their children, what's going on in their relationship, show what their house looks like, 
talk about their religious beliefs, their political beliefs, that content gets promoted. And influencers have told me this over and over again, like, I don't feel comfortable sharing pictures of my children, for example, or, you know, during times of 2020, like, I don't feel comfortable talking about when I got my vaccine and, and, you know, or whether I got my vaccine and what brand it was and what my side effects were, who I'm voting for and what do I think about, you know, all, all, every, you know, political controversy that happens, uh, but they feel that they have to in order to be seen. And then they are just, ma- they're making themselves vulnerable for attacks and or for, you know, bad faith interactions, you know, that really harm their well-being. And then at scale, when we think about the millions of people for whom this is a job, that is a lot of harm to a workforce. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Yes, this was really fun. Thank you. Thank you. So Luigi, I actually couldn't tell based on your questions if you are optimistic about the rise of influencers as compared to the past or pessimistic because one of your questions seemed to posit and I think you were being provocative in your questions obviously but one of your questions seemed to posit that this this was good that in general we should be optimistic about the rise of influencers and several of your other questions seem to seem to posit exactly the opposite. So what 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 do you think? Um I think that many of the criticism seems to me being backward looking and complaining that is different from the past when the past wasn't that great. However, I'm really, really concerned about the power that platforms have in shaping all this world. And I'm concerned at the commercial level, but I'm also concerned at the academic level and at the political level. So as you know, I'm not a fan of cryptocurrencies, but what I thought was strange is at some point, both Facebook and Google, I think, they decided not to allow ads of cryptos. And it was interesting because it was at the same time as Facebook was preparing the launch of uh, Libra, which is its own stable coins, which is a crypto. We are in a world in which... Uh, Platforms, especially if they coordinate, maybe tacitly, but they can block entry of what they want, even in the market arena with an enormous uh, market power. Now, if you translate that to the world of ideas, which is academia, or to the world of politics, this is really, really problematic. It's a different form of gatekeeper. And I think as Emily was getting at in our conversation, it's a less transparent form of gatekeeper than what existed in the past. I mean, the whole promise of the rise of social media was that people could have a unmediated way of getting their views to to other people. And it turns out it's very, very mediated and, and, and increasingly so. I suppose in some ways that was the way the media industry worked in the past in the sense that you needed to have access to a journalist to get your ideas in, in, in front of people. But it was, it was transparent that there were gatekeepers and it was transparent the way the gatekeepers operated. And now it's far less transparent. Would you agree with that analogy or that description? Um. In part, I don't know if you ever read this book by Ehrman and Chomsky, The Manufacturer of Consent. Yes. Yeah, it, it is uh, written at a very particular moment because it's 88 or 89. I don't remember the exact year, but it is basically before the fall of the Soviet Union and before the rise of social media. But they interpret the entire media ecosystem as, in my, in my language, an incentive scheme to deliver a particular result, which is... Uh, a pro-business result. And I always thought that the analysis was interesting, but a bit too extreme, because I thought that while those incentives existed, were not as strong and as powerful as they describe. But I feel that now you need to be blind not to see it. The entire system of what is rewarded, what makes you advance, is shaped by one or two platforms. And so whoever controls the platforms control the narrative, controls the way that you independently succeed. So this notion that you are independent is very fake because at the end of the day, you are massively dependent on what the platform wants to reward in terms of share and distribution. So let me try something out that I was thinking about, which is that it's different depending on what sphere of life you are in. So I think 
how political news gets disseminated both in the past and today and shaped, how business news gets disseminated and shaped, and how things get sold are, are really different. I remember being really shocked way back in the day when I was a business journalist at Fortune, which was owned by Time Inc., talking to someone who was working on a story about basically how corrupt much of fashion journalism was because there was kind of a, a pay for placement idea that things pretended to be editorial when in reality they were driven by advertisers and that there and there was this manufacturing of consent around around a product it wasn't transparent that something was being sold to you it came in the guise of this product being great but in reality the product was being pushed by an advertiser that felt shocking to me because business journalism at least in the old time ink days there wasn't anything explicitly being sold and yet when i look back on it i also feel that there was a worldview being being sold that free markets were the right and american and ethical way to, to to shape the world and we were all so indoctrinated in that that i don't even think we knew what what we were selling and yet, at the same time, the realities of the business world, like the blow up of Enron, would come along and expose problems in that that made it more difficult to sell a particular worldview. And even today, I think that there's there's a difference in how products are being sold, how politics are being sold, and how business is being sold. Yes and no. In a sense, I don't think that there is so much difference between product and business. If you are saying that there is or there are some underlying religions that you cannot touch I think that that's absolutely true. Now, these religions have changed, but that's to some extent one of the points of uh, Ehrman and Chomsky is at the time they write, anti-communism was the big religion. So especially on the political view, if you were accused of being even flirting with communist ideas, you were basically excluded from all the newspapers altogether. Today might be a different idea, might be that if you challenge the vaccine, you are out in the cold. Your retweet will not be considered. You run for president and you have, what, 20% of the support? Nobody talks about you. We are old enough to remember Ross Perot. Everybody was talking about Ross Perot, and Ross Perot got less than 20% of the votes, or roughly that, that amount. And even at a debate, and remember there was a debate with three candidates, we, we saw that. Do you think that Bob Kennedy will receive the same attention? No, because he's violating one of the rules and is out. I think business still remains a little bit more pure. I think it always was. And I think it remains a little bit more pure even today, because even though some of us who in the past were business journalists were inculcated in this worldview, these things, reality, would intercede on whatever we were selling in the form of a giant blow up that would be like, oh, oh, wait, oh, wait, <laughs> that 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 is that is telling us something. And I still think that's that's true today. But maybe we need to put that over to the side and get back to the discussion of how ideas are sold and how politics are sold. Because I think the cynicism is absolutely right in those areas. And I guess what I was trying to say is that some cynicism was probably warranted at, uh, at, and in the business world. But when things come along, like the collapse of Enron or the, the financial crisis of 2008 or the blow up of FTX, all of a sudden there's this way in which reality intercedes on the narrative or reality challenges the narrative that might be that might be being sold. And I still find in some ways even social media a little healthier in the business world than it might be in, in other areas and that it allows contrary opinions to be to be out there in a way that I think is, is somewhat healthy. Am I explaining myself a little bit better now? I think you are, but that allows me to disagree more openly. I don't think that the business world is better at all. You know who invented the advertorials, uh, editorials that are paid for, and yes, yeah, sure, the New York Times will tell you that they're paid for, but for most people, you don't see the difference. I think a lot of surveys suggest that most people don't perceive the difference. And make the New York Times, and I'm not, I'm, I'm not picking the New York Times because the Wall Street Journal and Washington Post were all the same, very dependent on that money, influenced by that money. And all this was invented by nothing short that Herb Schmartz, who was the vice president for communication of mobile, uh, and by the way, since we're talking about the Kennedy, was the guy who organized the political campaign on John Kennedy, Bob Kennedy, and Ted Kennedy. So I'm surprised, no, he's, he's there now, but he would be there to, to go for Bob Kennedy Jr. But So this is somebody who is very political, but used the same ideas to sell business. And uh, you know that he wanted to sell mobile as the upper class gasoline in the States. 
and the Porsche gasoline and sponsor fancy programs, TV programs in the States in order to associate his name to that. I don't see very different than the political arena. I still think that reality in the business world comes along and challenges whatever preconceptions you might have or whatever you're trying to sell in ways that are really uncomfortable and that don't happen as organically in the political world. In the political world, you can get away with selling a message that isn't true for a really long time. In the business world, if you try to tell the story that Enron is great or that the financial industry has everything under control, something comes along and, and challenges that view and blows it to smithereens every 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 so often. So I, I, I still stand by it. But I think I think it's a small corner of what we're talking about. So I don't want to get hung up on it. Because overall, I think that I think that the, your, your point is right. If you're enjoying the discussions Luigi and I are having on this show, there's another University of Chicago podcast network show you should also check out. It's called Not Another Politics Podcast. Not Another Politics Podcast provides a fresh perspective on the biggest political stories. It's not told through opinions and anecdotes, but rather through rigorous scholarship, massive data sets, and a deep knowledge of theory. So if you want to understand the political science behind the political headlines, then listen to Not Another Politics Podcast, part of the University of Chicago Podcast podcast network. Was there anything that Emily said in the interview that surprised you or that made you think differently about the influencer industry than you had thought before? Honestly, the part that interests me, and, and I understand that this is very parochial, but uh, the part that interests me is the impact it has on academia directly. The fashion industry, I'm sorry to say, was not a particularly clean industry to begin with, and it's hard to make it worse. So I'm not uh, losing my sleep over that. But I have seen over the course of my career uh, a dramatic change. So just to give you a sense, when I joined at the University of Chicago, occasionally in the hall, they posted some articles from The Economist that was featuring some articles of economists, okay? And, you know, The Economist is not exactly sort of popular uh, media, right? But many of my colleagues were raising eyebrows saying, oh, this is a bad thing because it pushes people to actually seek publicity by trying to write articles that The Economist will endorse. Fast forward 30 years, everybody is on Twitter, I discover that a former colleague has a capsule. Capsule. Do you know what is a capsule? No. What's a capsule? It's a, a mix and match of clothes products that you sell as a brand that you can use. Ah, I do know what I, that is. <laughs> I, I learned, I'm glad because I just <laughs> learned that for the occasion. So not only she's very popular writing books and et cetera, uh, but she's also into the fashion business. And do you see this as a bad thing because it's capitalizing on the rise of a personal brand? Or do you see this as a good thing in that it allows something different within the fashion industry than what would have been possible before? Again, because I care more about the damage to economics than the benefits <laughs> of the fashion industry, I am concerned about this. And I'm not concerned because you appear on a printed magazine promoting clothes. I am concerned for what I raised in the interview with Emily, the fact that if you want to have a brand, rule number one of a brand is consistency. Consistency requires that you send the same message over and over and over again. And this is really antithetical to what good research is about. Research is about proving others, but also yourself, wrong. That's the way research makes progress. And so if you want to have a consistent message, you're going to have for sure a consistently wrong message. There is no way in which as a researcher, you can have a consistently right message. And that's obviously happened in journalism, either concurrently or perhaps slightly before it happened in academia, where the idea of having a personal brand became more and more important. And I've, I, I have always found it somewhat somewhat horrifying. And I can't tell if that's just because I'm, I'm old fashioned, or if it's because I've been incapable of, of kind of thinking that way. But it is dismaying on, on, on some level. And it is, I, I, 
I mentioned this when we were talking to Emily, but I, I think I stole it from a book called Quiet, which uh, is about the value of introverts in an extroverted world. And she traced the rise of having a personality over having character to, I think, Dale Carnegie and his emphasis in the 1920s and 1930s on developing a personality so that you could sell yourself. And there's there's something about that that is that 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 and I'm, I'm struggling to put my finger on exactly what it is but there's something about that that I I have never liked maybe it's just the introvert in me I don't know I think you're absolutely right I, I think we should we should title this episode the triumph of uh, personality of a character but I, I, I want to be clear I see a lot of benefits on social media because I do think that for example research can travel much faster there is an exchange of ideas that is valuable I I wish just we had different kind of social media, especially for research, because uh, the one we have today, I don't think that helps. At least the the benefit is smaller than the cost they impose. Yeah, and I liked Emily's idea about professionalism and standards. And I know a lot of listeners and a lot of people, given the distrust in the media uh, media today, are going to laugh at my assertion that there was there there were standards, but there 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 were at least when I grew up at Time Inc. I, I started as a fact checker, and as a fact checker, there were these very specific things you had to do to make sure that every fact in a story was true, and that you, as the fact checker, stood behind the overall gist of the piece. So it wasn't just that the individual facts were true; you had to stand behind the entire gist of the piece. And there was a system. I mean, one that involved different colored pens to put little different check marks over where, where things came from. But nonetheless, there was there was a system. And, and, and more importantly, there was this sense of accountability that nothing could be published if it hadn't been if it hadn't been checked. And if it hadn't been if calls hadn't been made to the people who might have a different point of view, or if you said something nasty about somebody you had to call them first. And those were miserable calls to make, you know, having to be the little junior fact checker and having to call some executive and be like, this is what we're saying about you. Would you like to respond? Um, but it, it forced a discipline on the process and an accountability and a, and a transparency that I, I think is, is lacking today. I certainly wish there was more fact-checking, but I don't think that the solution is to impose some uh, norms or standards in the influencer uh, world, in part because it's a way in which the incumbent are going to shape some rules so that they make it more difficult for others to enter the industry. I think that this solution is to have an impact on the platform themselves. In a sense, uh, one of the problems is that there is no space for an editorial service to prosper on any social media. So I think I will, be, I will uh, uh, buy an editorial service that uh, filters news based on fact-checking, and I will pay a subscription fee for that. Unfortunately, uh, it's precisely the media that don't allow to have this service in place because they don't allow the interoperability. They don't allow somebody to get between me and the, the platform. I think that the regulation should take place in that direction to create this space because we desperately need stuff that is fact-checked. Capital Isn't is a podcast from the University of Chicago Podcast Network and the Stiegler Center in collaboration with the Chicago Booth Review. Also check out promarket.org, a publication of the Stiegler Center. The show is produced by me, Matt Hodap, and Lita Cesarine with production assistance from Utsav Gandhi, Sebastian Berka, and Brooke Fox. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a review wherever you get your podcasts.